Hello, everybody, and welcome to the third day of the Action Research in Holocaust Colloquium. This colloquium is an opportunity for teachers who've taken part in the English Australia Action Research in Holocaust program this year to present their action research projects. And all of the projects were about the theme of exploring new ways to assess learner progress. On behalf of English Australia, I'd like to thank the Action Research in Ellicos program partner, Cambridge Assessment English. English Australia and Cambridge have worked closely together on the Action Research program for the past 12 years, and they're a really valued partner. So I'll introduce the first presenter for today. Vahida Beborovic is an Ellicos teacher who works at UTS College. And Vahida is going to be presenting about her research project on peer assessment for writing tasks. Thanks, Vahida. Hi, thanks, Sophie. Hello. I'll tell you uh, about my dream from last night first, and it's got nothing to do with MLK. I dreamt that I was in this session and I forgot everything. I wanted to read my notes, but they were too small and I couldn't find my glasses. Now in this real session here, I've got my notes, I've got my glasses, um, so I'm already doing better than I did in my dream. Um, as Sophie said, uh, I have um, um, engaged in an action research project on peer assessment and peer feedback. I first became interested in this area when I attended a seminar by Professor John Hattie uh, and his team, uh, where they were uh, presenting uh, some of the findings from their visible learning project. Um, in this uh, project over many years, they, uh, they analyzed 65,000 studies, over 800 um, meta-analysis uh, in which 250 million students participated across four continents um, and uh, um, across all educational sectors. And they compiled that into a list, as you can see here on my next slide on the left hand side, which learning strategies are the most successful, uh, most um, <clears throat> beneficial to the student and you can see here in place three is feedback so i started investigating this a little bit further and i found out that feedback actually means peer feedback it's got nothing to do with teacher peer feedback if anything teacher teacher feedback is on the other side of the spectrum if not uh, harmful definitely not beneficial uh, i read a little bit further and found out that it is related to the zone of proximal development uh, which you can see a, um, a, a graphic here on the right hand side uh, so in the inner circle you can see a layer of all the things that the students can already do then there is the zone of proximal development these are all the areas the skills that are achievable for the students that they uh, know about and that they can achieve and then there is the outer layer all the other things that uh, are just way beyond their grasp and they cannot achieve those and very often teacher feedback teacher feedback falls into that outer layer peer feedback by its nature coming from a peer is almost always in the zone of proximal development and that's why and that's why it gets uh, applied and it is so beneficial so I was keen to start using this in all my classes, both my English and my diploma classes, but um, the response wasn't as I was expected and I couldn't really see um, that much benefit. Uh, so I was very happy that this year's um, theme was around assessment, including peer assessments. As Sophie said, I work at, uh, so uh, to investigate this further, I pose these questions. What are the main obstacles to student engagement in peer feedback process? What support systems can be put in place to support students when applying peer feedback? And how effective are these approaches? As um, Sophie mentioned, I work at UTS College. We are a pathways college. Um, and we provide foundation studies and 
a number of diploma courses which articulate into first year and second year respectively at UTS and we also provide academic English language courses from level one to level five. Successful completion of level five guarantees direct entry um, into all UTS courses. Uh, just last year uh, we developed a new curriculum for all our academic um, <clears throat> courses uh, and there was a little bit of a shift from not just English language skills but there is now also a focus on lifelong learning, academic research skills, uh, self-assessment strategies and peer feedback. So it was really good, my project really fitted in well with our new curriculum as well. Uh, I conducted the action research uh, project over two cycles. Uh, so altogether that's 20 weeks. Uh, my students were largely from China, but I also had students from Indonesia, South Korea, Russia, and Saudi Arabia. One of my students um, was a PhD candidate. 11 of my students progressed into master's degrees and 13 of the students enrolled in uh, undergraduate courses. The intervention uh, lasted from week three to week nine of a 10 week course and most of the activities and uh, focused around um, appropriate behavior uh, within uh, such an environment of providing feedback uh, and assessment to a peer uh, around the processes involved in that process and developing supporting developing and using supporting material uh, to um, encourage more uh, active uh, peer feedback sessions. <clears throat> the methods Oh, so here are a few examples. So on the left hand side, you can see a document from the very beginning of the intervention. Uh, this is when students are in small groups and they discuss positive and negative behaviors that each one of us um, uh, <clears throat> um, exhibits sometimes in groups or in, p in pairs. We then got together as a whole group and we mostly agreed on all the negative behaviors and we admitted that, you know, some of them we actually do ourselves. So we decided to take a pledge. Right hand on your heart, um, left hand, <clears throat> left palm up, and we all promised to try and eliminate or minimize those behaviors in our future interactions. On the right hand side, you can see a document towards the end of the intervention. This is when students are reading uh, one of their peers essay. And uh, these are elements that they uh, try and identify in their partner's writing. And every time they identify one of those elements, they tick them off. Um, at the end of that, they share this with the writer of the essay and they uh, look then together at all the areas that were not ticked and then you know there's a discussion if maybe uh, the peer the feedback giver didn't see them or whether they are really missing and how they could be added to the essay this is another typical activity throughout uh, the intervention stage this one is related to paragraph structure so after discussing practicing uh, paragraph structure, the students are put into pairs and they email each other one paragraph that they have written. The student then reads their partner's paragraph uh, or first the topic sentence and identifies and highlights the topic in one color, uh, the controlling idea in another color, then reads the rest of the paragraph and tries to then highlight verbs, phrases, clauses, structures that um, are related to the topic or related to the controlling idea. Then they get back together and they share this with the writer of the paragraph. Uh, and then they look at all the um, <clears throat> structures, phrases, clauses that have not been highlighted at all and discuss whether maybe the feedback giver didn't notice uh, what, what, you know, didn't know what to do with it or whether they should remove it, uh, delete or put into another paragraph. All right, so now the findings. Um, so, uh, sorry, first the research methods. So these are the research methods that I applied. Um, I uh, conducted a very short survey at the beginning and at the end of the course and followed it up with semi-structured interviews. Um, I also recorded many of the peer feedback sessions, not all. Um, I kept a journal in which I wrote my observations after those peer feedback sessions. I analyzed several of the uh, writing samples from students prior to the intervention at the end of the intervention and uh, we conducted an end of course reflection. 
So here are the results uh, from my from the second cycle uh, from the um, <clears throat> Uh, surveys um, and but the results from the first group were very similar so you can see there is quite a bit of reluctance at the beginning you can see that not all the students participated which gives you a bit of an answer how they feel and then at the end it's changed quite significantly and here are a few comments from the uh, semi-structured interviews that followed those um, <clears throat> uh, surveys so at the beginning it's very clear that the students are not so sure that they can give feedback and that their peers can actually uh, give them feedback because they're just students right but then at the end you can see quite a a change there and uh, there was a, a very common comment was you had to force me to do it before i could believe it um the peer feedback sessions the recordings from the peer feedback sessions could be divided into two groups um, the recordings from the first half of the intervention and the recordings from the second half. Uh, in the first half of the intervention, it was quite painful to watch those uh, sessions where the students are, uh, there is not very much interaction happening. They are very quiet. Very often you can just see the top of their head. You can't even, even see their face. And any interaction that's happening is mostly around technicalities. So um, what's your email? And uh, do I answer all the questions or just question one? There's actually very little feedback happening there. Uh, that uh, change and pro uh, they're progressively and then towards the end of, of the intervention, uh, the recordings are just a joy to watch where, the, where you can see the face of the students, it's open, they're smiling, and they're actually giving feedback to their partner. Uh, my journal entries uh, are very similar to the observations uh, from uh, from those uh, recordings. When they came back from their breakout rooms in the first half, they were usually the body language was closed. They were not ready to say very much. And if they did, it was like, oh, overwhelming. Oh, I don't know. I'm just a student. Uh, so, and it was clear that they were not very happy. And that changed over the weeks. And then at the the last few weeks were again just a joy to watch them come out of the um, breakout rooms and then ready to share what they had just noticed and it was quite common the students said like I saw this in my partner's writing I make exactly the same mistake but I never noticed it in my writing which it really um I have found in literature as well, and uh, literature says that when we read somebody else's writing, we apply this filter where we're kind of comparing it against our own writing, even if our writing is completely different, but there is some sort of comparison happening. So at the same time, while we are reading somebody else's writing, we are revising our own writing. Um, so it was uh, very satisfactory to notice that uh, in, in, in my students' um, statements. The student writing samples uh, prior to the session, uh, prior to the intervention and at the end of the intervention um, showed an improvement. But to be honest with you, I cannot claim that this was due to the peer feedback sessions. I, I, I wouldn't know, except for one, except for the referencing, I know for sure because referencing has been the bane of my life. I have tried different strategies and there's always about 50% of students who just don't do the citations right. Uh, and with these two groups, I actually noticed a really great improvement and it must be the peer feedback that was given to them. Uh, at the end of the course, uh, we conducted reflections. So the students recording themselves uh, reflecting on a number of points. So I gave them a list of um, areas that we had covered throughout the 10 weeks. And I asked them to comment on that topic and give me a recommendation of what could be done better in the future. And one of those topics is uh, peer feedback. This happens in week 10 when all the assessments are finished, the students are quite relaxed and you know, more open to provide uh, feedback and recommendations to their teacher. I, uh, when I analyzed their feedback, I divided it into three categories. Category one focuses mostly on, I think, my instructions, where I uh, gave them activities of a general nature, um, and uh, they recommended to me to uh, 
make it more structured, clearer, and to define narrowly expected outcomes. So they knew exactly what was expected from them at the end of the session. Uh, the second one surprised me quite a bit. Uh, they said that often they noticed something in their partner's writing, but they lacked the language to explain what what they thought about it or what was wrong with it. So they recommended more lessons and language of feedback. And lastly, also a little bit surprising, they said they really enjoyed peer feedback sessions. They wish there were more. However, with a qualifier, this, they should be shorter and really just focus on one area. So all in all, uh, I have just started a uh, third cycle and I know and I've already uh, made a few changes, so I need uh, to have more scaffolding, more practice before the students um, <clears throat> embark on their own feedback sessions, more concept checking and checklists. They love their checklists. However, what became very clear to me throughout uh, both interventions, and this is reflected if you attended day one in Paola's um, research as well, rapport building, uh, creating an environment of safety and trust cannot be stressed enough. As the students became more comfortable, as they started trusting their classmates and me, they became more comfortable, they were uh, ready to take more risks, they were more confident to give feedback and more open to receiving feedback. Um, and also tying in back with day one, the second session, what Dale and Kate mentioned, and I found the same uh, in my research, the students at the beginning were very, very skeptical. I gave them a high bar to reach and they rose to the challenge. So it is really good to challenge students to expect a lot from them and they will rise to the challenge. Thank you very much. That's the end of my session. Thanks so much for that, Vahida. Um, if anyone has any questions for Vahida, please type them into the Q&A box. There's a question for you already. It's from Jenny. She wants to know how you felt when you saw the videos of student sessions where they didn't really interact. Oh, awful, just awful. And I think uh, if it hadn't been for this action research project, I probably would have given up. So it's really good that I, because of the action research project, I had to persist. Um, and yeah, the benefits later on became obvious, but it was very painful. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. And, and then I realized this is what was wrong in the past when I used peer feedback. Every time I did a session and the students were like, oh, not very enthusiastic, I just gave up and moved on to other things. So sometimes it's worth persisting with things. Yeah, okay. I think that might be it for the questions. I'll just give people another 10 seconds. Yeah, I, I really um, liked the way that you linked the PC back to the Hattie research and also the zone of proximal development because I think it yeah. um, gives a really strong argument for Oh, it was just so revealing to me. Mm. I, I got often so frustrated, and I know many of my colleagues do too, when I give them detailed notes about what's wrong with their writing and they seemingly, to me, they just ignore everything that I've written. Yeah, yeah. Um, Glenda has a question for you. Did your students have that type of feedback in their home countries? So I think she means peer feedback. Peer feedback. Uh, as far as I know, no. It was a completely new concept, I believe, to if not everyone, but most of them. And I had several master students and one PhD student, and it was those ones I, I know it was a new concept to them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess that's even more important to provide that scaffolding and training then that you provided. Yeah. Um, Anne has asked um, if you can say something about your next plans for peer feedback. Um, I... Sorry, would you mind repeating that, yep. Sophie? Can you say something about your next plans for peer feedback? Oh yeah, for sure. So I'm, I'm now doing the third cycle. So I'm just trying very busily implementing all the recommendations I received from my students from the two previous um, cycles. So 
changing things uh, around um, and spending more time on uh, clarity and um, and um, building rapport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm interesting to hear about um, how much they liked the checklists as well. Yeah, oh, they love those. <laughs> I think that that shows that that's very clear and that's something that they know. Um, so they're much more confident straight away to do that. And I'm I'm thinking I will probably reorganize it, provide more checklists at the beginning, and maybe take them away a little bit later when they become more confident. Yeah, yeah, they're very accessible, aren't they? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, well, that's it for the questions. So thank you again for sharing all of your insights with us, Fahida. Thank you. And now I'll introduce our next presenters. We have Makesh Abazi and Snow Chernova from Take Queensland joining us today to talk about their research project on ipsative assessment in grammar and using e-portfolios. Thanks, Snow and Makesh. Hi, everyone. Hello. So our research um, involved using ipsative assessment, and we will explain ipsative assessment through this uh, presentation. And uh, we used it to encourage um, ELACO students and their grammar excellence uh, um, using e-portfolios. And my name is Mikesh. And my name is Snow. And we are currently both working at uh, the ELACOS program at TAFE in Brisbane, South Bank. Um, and TAFE is quite a large organization and uh, ELACOS is the structural unit within that program. Um, and we um, teach to both local students through the AMEP programs and also international students through the ELACOS program. And within the ELACOS English classes, we have face-to-face, um, -face. we also have virtual, and now we have hybrid, which has cameras inside the classroom when you're teaching to both, um, both classes. So, and we also have the virtual synchronous, online asynchronous teachers. And within that, TAFE ELACOS has diagnostic, formative, and summative assessment types. And uh, we wanted to also introduce IPSATIV. So um, here is a picture of a student and we can see the marks here. So one student has the C grade, the other student has the A plus. And um, who do we perceive as the better student? And so probably a lot of people will say, well, of course, the student with the A plus. But we actually wanted to look a bit deeper into that and think about who is the better student here. And we wanted to introduce Ipsative because we, we want to look at how students can grow within that learning and um, not just achieve the A plus scores. So as, as educators, you know, we believe that um, students will progress and continue us over time, um, both personally and academically. And we wanted to introduce uh, academic opportunities for them to fail and try again and fail and try again as many times as it as it takes for that person and see them grow through that. And conventional education, you know, is often based on exams. And, um, you know, we're looking at these test scores as a measure, but we want to not judge students with their test scores, but um, see it as a more holistic approach. Hey, Helicos used to have three major assessment types, such as diagnostic, formative and summative. Unfortunately, those assessment tasks were more focused on high achievers and academically confident students with high intrinsic motivation. Mukesh and I have introduced a supplementary assessment type known as an ipsative assessment approach. What we wanted to achieve is to evoke the student's personal best and catalyze every student's potential. So we believe that the Ipsative Assessment approach uh, is aimed at enhancing students' motivation, engagement, and also self-accountability. Um, Ipsative. So um, Ipsative refers to the academic measurement uh, based on intra-individual comparisons. So we encourage students though, to, com to compete only against themselves, to monitor their academic progress in dynamics, and also to set long-term goals for their uh, academic achievements in lifelong learning. 
Uh, as for the educators, so they must refrain from comparing their students to other students' performances and also um, refrain from assessing their students in accordance with the preset standards and criteria so because we are all unique individuals. Ipsative assessment uh, shifts the focus from academic difficulties to academic differences and from making mistakes and errors uh, to being unique uh, to be able to respond to the pedagogical uh, feedback, peer feedback, uh, be able to learn from previous mistakes and grow as an individual. First. Um, so the best way to describe the gist of Ipsative assessment is to imagine oneself at the gym when you go to the gym or when I go to the gym. And here is <laughs> snow at the gym. <laughs> and yeah, this is my family at the gym. Yeah. So I don't normally um, compete, uh, compete with others. And so just really, I don't train for the Olympic Games and I don't want my coaches and trainers to compare my personal successes and failures with other people's performances. So what is really important for me is just to understand my own limits and say to understand the edge of my own capabilities. And, um, you know, my next slide, Vahida has so nicely already summarized <laughs> by Gotsky's zone of proximal development. And this was very relevant for Snow and I, because when we're thinking about our students, when something is in that outer zone, it is very, very much too difficult for them. And, you know, students become frustrated and, you know, they're not achieving their best at that stage because they're just sort of um, feeling frustrated and giving up a little bit. So we really thought about working within this zone of proximal development and looking at what, what learners can achieve in that, you know, sort of 12 week term. Um, so we really felt like any education must be focused on encouraging, motivating and boosting individual's potential. We have identified at least eight Ipsative assessment games. Heterogeneous students arrive in Australia with an era of different academic experiences and unfortunately learning grammar using an Ipsative assessment approach hasn't been experienced by them. So this very concept novelty encourages their uh, engagement, it encourages their motivation. Um, so, and so as a result, so their epistemic or inborn curiosity is born. Uh, when the, the final work is complete, so we can see our students' brain maturity level as well as their lingua cultural uniqueness. Um, so uh, Mukesh and I believe that and the Ipsative assessment approach is both relevant for developing students' um, learning skills as well as uh, language learning aspects. In our case, so it was grammar. Our students completed so multiple um, multimedia edutainment tasks, and so the whole education process was full of joy and enjoyment. And um, it also triggered concomitant learning. So our students they learned a lot of new skills, even without realizing that they were learning them. Uh, so they learned subconsciously. Our students were able to respond to the pedagogical feedback and peer feedback, and the Ipsative assessment approach helped us um, to shift the focus from the burden task culture, say, to the outcome focus culture in the classroom. Um, so initially we had four upper intermediate uh, virtual students and they were recruited for this research program. Um, and, um, you know, the four students, they had dissimilar academic backgrounds and came from four different, different locations. So Indonesia, Japan, Philippines and Argentina. And the ages ranged from 20 to 65 years old. And um, no, none of these students had ever experienced assessment or learning. Um, Snow and I did a lot of planning and then we set about how we were going to go you know, with this research project. And in the words of Professor Anne Burns, you know, we know that action research is related to reflective practice and teacher as researcher and in action research involved, you know, self-reflective critical systematic approaches. And we felt like, you know, already that was um, hand in hand with Ipsative, hand in hand with portfolios. Um, you know, there's a lot of phases here. I won't have time to explain all of the phases, but 
really, you know, it's not any different from what we already do as a teacher. But as a teacher researcher, we are also collating and using our surveys in the classroom. It could just be just the same as our classwork. So it's sort of worked together. Uh, yeah, as Mukesh has already mentioned, maybe there is no time say, to describe each phase in detail. But I would like to say that say, just like uh, collating uh, students' artifacts from e-portfolios uh, was uh, really entertaining say, because we created short video films say, just using, uh, while using their artifacts. And say, we watched those video films in the classrooms and we exchanged pe uh, pe uh, say, pedagogical feedback, peer feedback, and also self-evaluation. And uh, in the end of the project, so every student received an individual feedback um, in accordance with the IPSIT of assessment metrics. So a 10 step process, a 10 phase process, it was long. It was quite long. <laughs> yeah, it was long and big. <laughs> and, and we wanted students to embrace technology as well. So, you know, we designed the program we gave, and as Fahida said, the students love checklists. We gave them a, a little booklet with all the uh, schedule and the guide and checklists for each task that they were um, working on. And within that, uh, they used a lot of these programs. So Spark Adobe Pages, the Spark Adobe, they did collages, slideshows, and with the yeah, Spark Photo collage, slideshow, Canva, they made posters, comic strips, um, flyers for a film, they did emojis, Reface app was probably the most popular, and they used the cartoon cartoon app to talk about friendships, um, Smart Survey and Tesmos and Blogs were where we were collating that data um, and using it for us to assess their progress, and then they also used YouTube and Vokaroo, but uh, the multimedia tools really enhanced their learning, we felt. Uh, all Ipsitive assessment research tasks were based on live upper intermediate course book by Paul Dummett and John Hughes from National Geographic's Engaged Learning. Uh, there were six main uh, topics, six main theme blocks, such as getting to know you, relationships, storytelling, science and technology, art and creativity, and finally, development. Each theme block comprised three different executive assessment grammar tasks um, with gradually increasing uh, difficulty levels. In line with purpose categorization, all executive assessment tasks were classified into three main types, such as selected response or conscious raising tasks, uh, limited production are uh, very similar to closed exercises and extended production or simulation activities. The IPSID of assessment program uh, was a 12 week IPSID of assessment journey. So just to explain this a little bit further, because we're looking at their growth, we're not comparing their results to other students in the class. And we wanted to know, we wanted to build rapport. And uh, as other people have said, like Dale, Kate and Vahida, you know, building rapport with students is so vital and important in the classroom. And we could really see their personality, character, interests and um, with what they choose as well. So with this student, you know, she chose with her reface app, she chose something that she was interested in. And so the selected response, and then she made a, a film script from that. And then she went on to do the, the second uh, task and the limited production. And then the final task was this writing. So it's building from the task one, task two, task three, gradually getting a little bit harder each time. Um, but it can really shows their characteristics and their personality with their you know, artifacts that they produce. So we thought about, um, you know, how do we measure? And it is quite hard to measure this, you know, we, we admit that. But uh, so we, we thought about, uh, this is how we will measure it. So this is our iterative success metrics, autonomous learning, proactivity, their emotional intelligence, creativity, selectivity, and criticality. So uh, with these, you know, we had a little bit of a checklist of our own that, that we use. So we were just looking at, are they able to work autonomous, autonomously, you know, and, and just tracking their progress with our metrics there. 
I'll talk a little bit more about our research findings. So first of all, I would like to say that our students participants, they, just everyone, they reduce the anticipated fear of receiving poor um, grammar assessment test results. So I think this is the, the most important achievement. Um, also, we created an outcome focused culture and all our students completed all uh, of the Ipsative assessment tasks, regardless of external or external obstacles. Our students' confidence in using technology, uh, they really boosted, they really increased, and so they, they learned how to, how to utilize different multimedia um, uh, technologies, uh, multimedia tools. And uh, all our research participants, I just like were able to show their creativity, and I think that Mukesh, you would agree with me, say so their creati creativity really They were increased. amazing. Yeah, yeah. So their cre creativity really increased and say so they started using the, um, such techniques as comic tricks, photo collages, and say so silent, so they created silent movies on YouTube and it was really amazing. And um, finally, say so when we conducted a, a grammatical post-treatment quiz, so uh, we they so we really saw that their uh, grammatical progress um, improved significantly. So they showed better better results. And I think that was mostly to do with the incidental learning. That was a big factor with their, you know, their improvements because they were just they felt like they were having fun with multimedia tools, but they were actually using a lot of English and grammar to. It, it was edutainment rather than education. It was yes. edutainment. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, they did. it was a you know a lot of fun elements to it. Um, so here um, we're going to just speak about the Ipsative recommendations, and um, you know, firstly, we know that Ipsative assessment does not replace. Uh, what we normally have in place with our normative, uh, our formative and summative assessment. Um, and, you know, obviously we still need all the, all the data we collect from our formative summative, but it sits within that and probably sits more in the formative assessment. Um, also, we thought about the instructional, instructional diversity must be minimized. If you have too many teachers and too many different styles of teachings, you know, that can be a bit chaotic for students. Um, it also depends on the quality of the tasks that you develop. So Snow and I spent time developing those tasks. We made a lot of Spark pages, which I think you could use the QR code to access those. Um, and we try to make good quality, clear tasks for the students to follow. And that is important as well. And we created a lot of samples, Mukesh, so uh, 38 Spark pages, say so with our pedagogical samples and yeah. okay, very well, detailed. There was samples. always a sample, yeah, for each task. And um, the teacher um, student relationships and the emotional, emotional bonds, again, building that rapport was really important. Um, and commitment and Number six, really, that was quite important, a similar technology acceptance mindset. So we did have some resistance from some students who were not so tech savvy, but I think just um, working on that uh, helped them along with their progress with technology. And uh, we just thought about the organizational fluidity, not to have too many changes during uh, a research program such as this, because you do need to build those, um, you know, build a strengthen those ties with the students. So our final slide is um, actually showing the journey of one of the students where we asked the students to put together their videos and all of their artifacts and make it into a small video. And this was one of the students work. I don't think we have time to play it. So I think we're probably out of time, but you will be able to access this from the slides. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Nam Mikesh. Um, we will be sharing the slides and the recordings with people. Um, we'll email attendees um, to let you know the link where you can access the site and the recordings tomorrow. Does anyone have any questions for Snow and Rakesh? Okay, all 
has a question for you. He has asked, you mentioned that students created silent films. Did students have autonomy around which tasks they would complete or were the tasks planned by the teachers? I, um, I would start, so Mikesh, if you don't yep. mind. Mm -hmm. so, um, actually, I believe that our students had enough autonomy so, to create those films because they were presented in weeks 11 and 12. It, it was like the, the conclusion the conclusion, so the, the final step of the journey. And I would agree that when we started the journey, so our students were not so confident about using technology, but so when we reached week 11 and 12, they were autonomous. So they were able to, to utilize different multimedia tools and they were able say, to create those silent films and even upload them and create their YouTube channels. So that is why they didn't uh, they didn't request any external help while uh, while completing so the tasks from week one and two they needed a lot of help a lot of guidance and a lot of support but by week twelve and eleven and twelve so they were uh, pretty autonomous yeah and there was a repetitive nature to the tasks so once they had done it in one week and then they might have used the same program again in a later you know, through the program of the 12 weeks, they got better at it. And um, so that reduced the frustration and they could be quite autonomous with it. But yes, as Snow said, we needed to give a bit of guidance at the beginning. I would say that we used a lot of technology drill so during those 12 weeks. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Yeah, I think that's it for the questions. Um, I loved the images of you at the gym, Snow. I think <laughs> they, it, it's a really great way to explain the concept of iterative assessment. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense comparing it to exercise goals. Um, so yeah, it was a great presentation, um, really engaging and so many ideas to think about for our teaching as well. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. So before I finish, um, I'd like to hand over to Professor Anne Burns now, um, who will wrap up today. Anne is the key academic reference person for the English Australia Action Research in Helicos program. And Anne runs the Action Research program workshops, and she works closely with the teachers doing the program to develop their projects. Um, Anne, thank you for everything. Thank you for all your work on the program, for all your support of teachers over the year, over the years and, the, and this year, and also for all of your passion and advocacy for action research. So I'll hand over to you now, Anne. Oh, thank you for those kind words, Sophie. I think I've told you before, it's one of the pleasures, the greatest pleasures of the work that I do. And I just wanted to say to the people who've been watching, I think if you've been able to watch all three days of these presentations, or even just today, you will be you will have been amazed at the work that these wonderful teachers have done. I can't say how impressed I am with the way that they have taken up the opportunity to conduct these action research projects. And I can I think you can see the results of all the work that they've done to to conduct their research, but also to provide some wonderful presentations to round it off. I'm always amazed that everybody wants to do far more data collection than I ever tell them to do. You know, I would say, keep it small, keep it simple, but you can see that the enthusiasm becomes so infectious and so great that people want to go really above and beyond uh, what uh, we conceive of as, as the program. If you're interested in doing action research, please think about uh, joining the program next year. It'll be continuing, which will be absolutely wonderful. And uh, you can find information about how to apply on the uh, English Australia uh, website. I'd like to also say a very, very sincere thank you to Sophie. She's she's a partner and a part of the program that I could not do without. She's always there to, to keep everything going and her enthusiasm is, is very infectious. Uh, we're grateful too. And I, I personally am very grateful for the continuing support of English Australia and also Cambridge English. Um, it's been an absolute joy over 12 years to continue with this program. And, and I hope you've really enjoyed today's session. So thank you to everybody. 
and congratulations to all the teachers who've presented this week. Thank you so much. So, and so could I say that you're an amazing leader and so a highly intelligent, highly knowledgeable supervisor. And thank you very much for this very chance. I would join again and again and again. <laughs> <laughs> Snow highly... wants to do it every year. Every year. <laughs> But yes, we, we've had an amazing experience. And I think, as we said in our workshop three, it's going to be part of our lives now. We will always, always adopt action research in everything we do. So thank you so much for this experience. Thank you. And we'll be issuing the call for expressions of interest in the 2022 program in uh, early November. So keep an eye out for that. Um, there'll be an email going out about it, but there'll also be information on the English Australia website. All right, and it's going. been great to have the collaborative, um, you know, other participants and getting to know new people. So we've made friends with Dale and Rose and Kate and Sue. And yeah, it's just been an amazing journey as well, just to have some more friends in Australia. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, the networks that have been formed yeah. this year are incredible. All right. Well, thank you to our presenters today. Thank you, Anne. Thank you once again to our partner, Cambridge Assessment English. And thank you for every, to everybody for coming along to the Action Research Colloquium. See you later. Thank you.